Well, let me hand over Jean-Luc to you to begin, to open the panel. Uh, we decided, we uh, the, uh, proposed opposite. to, yes, to Pedro go first. Okay. You want to introduce the panel? Is there a panel chair? I'm the chair. Okay. Yes, just I'm the chair, so <laughs> go ahead and I'll, I'll guide. Okay, okay. okay. Yes, thank you very much. And this way, Gianluca can set the record straight in case I <laughs> talk crazy things. <laughs> so, because today I will speak about the, what I call the invisible international health regulations, which became quite visible during COVID-19. But as I argue, so, and going back to Lisa's um, introductory remarks, it's actually more of a daily practice matter than we think. And so in the ages of the upcoming discussion that the special session of the World Health Assembly challenges, so how to, <clears throat> how to keep in mind this daily practice related to the IHR while acknowledging, of course, the multiple shortcomings that we have seen during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, besides uh, Sam's uh, keynote speech where he rightly pointed out that you know, the IHR had fallen short in many respects, and Sharif also mentioned it, I believe. Uh, Gianluca has written uh, extensively on the matter, uh, explaining to us why the IHR have fallen short. And, and actually, not only that, but of course, uh, Gianluca was at the birth, was present at the birth and had a major role in, yeah, <laughs> in, the, in the midwife of the international health regulations. <laughs> So I, it is, of course, a privilege to be speaking next to the person who helped bring them into the world. Uh, since, I mean, this, this brings me back to when they were approved at the World Health Assembly of 2005. Uh, so it was an intergovernmental process that lasted for several years where, uh, you know, there was a working group in task with uh, drafting not only the articles, but also annotated uh, commentaries of, you know, what, how they could be interpreted. And, well, one of the peculiar features of this uh, legal instrument is, as you may have known as, as we have discussed in the past days, is that under Article 21 of the Constitution of the WHO, you know, once the World Health Assembly approves them and a period of time is set in the regulations, these become binding, uh, legally binding for states unless they opt out. So this is atypical, right? Usually other international agreement treaties, of course, require a ratification process, which usually goes through uh, national, other national bodies having to approve them besides the delegates that vote for them at the international level. Um, but in the case of the regulations, and I was looking at the minutes of the World Health Assembly when they were approved. Uh, the, the president of the World Health Assembly, Ms. Salgado from Spain, simply said, well, we have here the new regulations. Uh, you, the delegates of whatever states, do you have anything to say? Nobody said anything. I said, fine, the regulations are approved by consensus. Congratulations, everybody. A new legal instrument was born in such a fast paced matter without a vote, without having discussion because most of the discussions had been undertaken through this intergovernmental working group that drafted the text. So you see, it was quite a, a, an expedient uh, process, but of course, this um, meant that movement probably meant that multiple discussions didn't take place in the, in the usual way. So this will be the big question that is in the upcoming negotiations. How will this, what will discussions look like they might look very differently than what they looked like in 2004 when this intergovernmental group met. And precisely in this regard, uh, you know, looking at the intergovernmental group's documents and going back to Sam Sarifi's keynote speech, indeed, uh, the, this group that contributed to draft the international health regulations referred to human rights and how the IHR related to human rights, but mostly, though not only, mostly as an obiter dictum, right? So, oh, and by the way, human rights may be relevant uh, for what the provisions of the international health regulations. And moreover, they focus on international, uh, on the SECPR, on civil and political rights. No mention was made by them to economic, social, and cultural rights. 
following this trend. And furthermore, they were focusing on individualized measures. They didn't have in mind either the type of all of society pandemics like COVID-19, where really entire swaths of the population are placed in lockdown, quote unquote, lockdowns, for instance. They were more concerned about individuals, travelers, for instance, and what type of measures they could be subjected to that might infringe upon their human rights. So this already reflects a mindset that was as, um, fixated on you know, the, the, the very specific instances in which human, individual human rights may be affected. But again, following Gianluca, maybe uh, an event like COVID-19 was simply not you know, foreseeable to that extent, or you know, the other hypothesis can be even that their political will simply wasn't there to go further in terms of human rights. So this, and this is, both hypotheses are feasible, and in my view, not to cast a gloomy picture, but I'm you know, trying to link it as well to Sam Sarif's keynote because I think it set the scene for the upcoming debates. You know, considering the, the global climate that Sam was referring to, I mean, indeed, it was as as I imagine was the case with the Syracuse of principles in the eighties that the global climate was not favorable initially, and it currently probably isn't for you know a deeper engagement with human rights, considered the type of global commitment that we need, right? some states are simply unable to give in to the push for human rights. And so this will lead us to the difficult question, well, what do we, what happens then with the regulations? I mean, because uh, indeed, if the process is opened, currently at the special session of the World Health Assembly, there are two tracks, you know, two processes open. One is the international health regulations, uh, potential reform, and another one is a new pandemic treaty or other legal instrument, uh, which uh, Gianluca was talked to us about. Um, but even if the regulations are revised, what type of commitments can be expected and from which member states? Uh, this will be a massive challenge in my view, if there is, if we strive towards a stronger commitment within the regulations to human rights, and not just leaving them currently as obitae dictum as, as it is and with lack of clarity on what to do when we face uh, all of society pandemics like COVID-19. And lastly, um, you know, this does not mean that nothing can be done. Of course, some issues have been done. Uh, I believe it was Jude who mentioned that you know, the WHO and particularly under current WHO Director General uh, Tedros Adam Ghebreyesus has indeed increased its references and its guidelines to human rights. Uh, for instance, by stating that uh, there is a need to respect human rights as public health responses, uh, whenever measures such as uh, you know, lockdowns are uh, taken or adopted. And this already indicates that there is at least an awareness by the secretariat in this case, by our WHO secretariat when developing these guidelines that this Probably cannot be ignored, and so this should be part of the public health response. And even though there is no, of course, full clarity or full catalog on with how exactly they they should do it, but it is present. So we could also ask whether ourselves whether the Secretariat and the WHO as a technical agency could go further than it currently does. Um, the, regardless of what happens with the upcoming lawmaking process. But this can also be another way forward. I know it's not the ideal setting, but it, nevertheless, it could be a positive step towards recognizing the need to conform to human rights obligations during uh, pandemics. So, um, so maybe the WHO's regulations in terms of the constitution are design, by design limited and in the reach and scope. So how far we can go with them in comparison to another legal instrument may be, it may not be as uh, ambitious as we can expect them to be, but nevertheless, I personally believe that additional steps can be taken with the current, what both with the current regulations that would a revised version to uh, strengthen the presence of human rights in public health responses to pandemics. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much.
Thank you. And <clears throat> so I'll say a few things about this uh, uh, pandemic treaty in the making. Um, I took seriously my instructions in terms of timing. So it gave me 20, 10 minutes. I definitely try not to exceed my time. So there's no time, I think, for deep uh, theoretical analysis. But I thought I would uh, at least try to uh, contextualize uh, the, uh, the state of play, as I see it. Uh, and maybe uh, to contextualize, it's useful to start from the plethora of reviews that we've seen on COVID. Uh, we mentioned the IPDPR, uh, GPMB, the IHR Review Committee, but also the policy making level, the G7, the G20, European Union. So everybody has, in a way, converged on uh, analyzing what happened and proposing ways forward. And there are, I think, obviously, uh, these proposals come and anal analysis come from many different directions, but I think they focus on a converge on a few areas. One is governance, the fact that we have governance gaps, and there's always the temptation uh, to propose something new, global health council and so on. The second is clearly power and control. We see the dominance of the political class, G7 and G20, vis-a-vis -a, -vis, uh, a rather weakened uh, global system, the, the United Nations uh, system in particular. The third is financing. There's really a big financing gap of global public good or national capacity and so on. So a lot of the conversation has converged on new financing models. The fourth is equity, one of the main victims of the pandemic. The fifth, which I think is consequential, is the balance between public and private interest. That is clearly something that is very raw and will remain raw for a while. And finally, which takes me to the uh, pandemic treaty proposal, is the need for legal rules. The, the feeling that we cannot really have a better system of preparedness if we don't have updated, uh, legitimate, uh, more effective rules of behavior. And it's interesting that people don't just look at political frameworks, but they really want international law. And so here comes the proposal for a, a pandemic treaty uh, that has been very pushed by the European Union and, and, and a number of European countries, but it's fair to say that it's gathering uh, quite an, a, an element of support. Basically, all the reviews I mentioned uh, support and welcome the treaty. Uh, many scholars have gone in favor. I think the person on my left is one of the few skeptics that I know about. Um, and so there has been interesting the dynamic because it's been rather top down, very fast moving, uh, presented as a dogma that it's an, an unquestionable that we need a pandemic treaty, but also uh, with some pushback or some skepticism, in particular from a growing number of low middle income countries that have felt a bit overwhelmed by the pressure and then a position around key issues that become bottom line for even engaging in a discussion, mostly equity and access to countermeasures. So we have this um, uh, session of the Health Assembly that will start a new process um, with resistance as to whether the process will be squarely on negotiating a treaty or something broader, basically postponing the fights. But it's clearly the importance of the process cannot be underestimated. Uh, the, it will be a measure of the legitimacy of the buy-in of the prospect for a potential future treaty that obviously can remain uh, a, a list of pious intentions if it doesn't respond to uh, the, the, the deeply felt need that comes with this traumatic experience. So the, the process until now, and arguably uh, the process that will unfold after the, after the next week, converges, I think, on three main questions. Why do we need a treaty? And there are still, still, still many questions around it. The second is, why are we focusing on a treaty as a salvation of mankind? What about the remaining ecosystem? Because it cannot just be one instrument that somehow solves what we've seen. And the third, what is the benefits, advantage, and what is the content of the treaty? In terms of the main arguments in favor of the treaty, uh, the, the first is there are clearly gaps to fill with international law, and I agree with that. The second is that uh, we need to generate sustained uh, whole of government commitment, have the prime minister, have the presidents invested in international rules. That's something that arguably the IHR cannot do. The third is that, the, again, the IHR uh, should not be thrown away uh, with the bathwater, but 
They are a narrow instrument constrained by the mandated WHO. They are too technical, too much the sandbox of uh, uh, ministers of health with the low compliance and so on. So there are fundamental intrinsic um, weaknesses that need a different approach. The fifth is the, the fourth actually, is the lack of accountability uh, in the current system that the, the treaty will fix. And, the, um, and so these are some of the main systemic arguments. To be fair, the Friends of the Treaty, there's a group called the Friends of the Treaty, Europeans, but also beyond, have not done a terribly good job to market the product. What we've seen is relatively vague, which reveals also a lack of unity within uh, the group. Um, the, some of the opponents or the skeptics, like the United States, have done a much better job to explain why we shouldn't rush uh, into negotiating a treaty. So also from the narrative and framing point of view, we have some, we don't have, I think, a very, very clear uh, slate uh, in terms of whether we will we, we go. Uh, in terms of the substance and, 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 and the main benefits, I would mention very quickly 10 points, just mention them, obviously. The first is one health and zoonotic risk. Here we clearly have a blind spot in international law, but we also we have a field of incredible complexity. And it will be a challenge to see how it can be somehow conceptualized and operationalized in a treaty. The second is clearly the lack of preparedness and what IHR core core capacity at a national level. Uh, that's something that the IHR has tried to address, not effectively enough, and I question whether the treaty can somehow, I don't know, almost overlap or somehow complement the IHR. The third is uh, the question of transparency, uh, sharing information of a better system of international alert. The treaty would put more pressure, would create incentives that the IHR were unable to create. The fourth is empowering and strengthening WHO. That's a recurring argument. It has to be politically backed, it has to be better financed, it has to have a stronger mandate in giving early alert, in bypassing state resistance, in having a easier access to states for purpose of verification of assistance and so on. The fifth is access to pathogen and benefit. That's, as we know, the uh, conversation has been dominated by the Nagoya Protocol and the impact of biodiversity law on the possibility of sharing pathogens. So many people, myself included, actually see the treaty as an opportunity to carve out a better system for public health. The, the sixth is a better coordination of travel and trade measures. We see the mess we are in, we are still in, even in a relatively cohesive uh, part of the world like Western Europe. So a mechanism to try to incentivize more con con uh, consultation or harmonization of measures, which is possible. The seventh is a huge elephant in the room that can derail everything, which is a question of equity, of equitable access to countermeasures. That's a universe in its own right. That goes from the sharing of pathogen to research and development to uh, marketing approval, regulatory issues, technology transfer, managing of intellectual property, manufacturing. It's, it's a universe in its own right. But it's one of the main uh, pillars of the discussion. It would be interesting to see what, what, how its focus is in terms of treaty language. The eight is accountability. The IHR are lacking accountability framework. So the, uh, the treaty is seen as a possibility of introducing a, a better accountability framework, a better system of compliance assessment. The ninth is governance, the idea of the framework convention and a conference of the parties that will build somehow a community that will develop the normative framework and, and so on. And finally, financing, the link to the various proposal and seeing the treaty as a conduit uh, for financing both national capacity and, and global public good. Finally, um, what are some of the pushbacks? Uh, the first is, and I, I'm happy that there is a, a growing support for the IHR, a sense the IHR has been undermined in part as a tool to, 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 to market the treaty. Don't throw it away, strengthen it, revise it, and so on. So the, the strong sense the IHR will remain the centerpiece. So a treaty should complement, but not duplicate the IHR. The second is a fear of fragmentation. Here we have yet a new instrument and so on. And it's interesting that the proponents of the treaty see actually the treaty as a response to fragmentation, as creating a single roof like the Biodiversity Convention or the Climate Change Convention, they've been a catalyst for so many things. The, the third is equity, that many countries say we want clear guarantees 
that this is not anti rhetoric, otherwise, we don't even engage in talking about the treaty. The fourth is WHO. Is it the right forum? For many uh, reasons. The fifth is the need to look more broadly. Uh, everybody, we can't obsess about WHO in treaty in isolation. There are many other pieces that need to move. Uh, WTO and intellectual property is one, so many other parts, including human rights. And finally, the lack of human rights. And I think we've been discussing about that. So this is a bit of the pros and cons in, in very rough terms of the debate as I, as I see it now. Thank you. Thank you, John. And I stayed with him at 10 minutes. You really mm -hmm. did. You were both uh, very effective there. Um, so I'm going to open up to the floor, uh, Shawifa. Um, so thank you. So um, Pedro is really <laughs> intrigued. And in some ways, uh, it really also ties in with you, John Luca. So you make this point about kind of the IHR, uh, kind of the things that it seems to value. But in some ways, it's not even part of a broader systemic problem with global health and neoliberalism that the IHR's idea of rights is individualistic, but it also has another commission of tread. And we kind of see that these are kind of fundamental tenets of any neoliberal system that almost kind of diametrically opposed to global health as a public good. And so, really, to both of you, so with those kind of fundamental tensions, do you think there is any possibility of success in creating a treaty that really deals with global public health goods effectively? Should I say that? Yes, thanks so much for your talk. <coughs> very much. Yeah. I, I agree that the IHR were informed by this perspective, I guess, but back then, and also particularly the response to communicable diseases was strongly informed by the biomedical perspective, right? So let's deal with the individualized interventions, medical and public health interventions, and let's try to make sure that they don't you know, go roll over human rights, rather, but rather the broader societal problems, uh, the broader societal challenges of uh, lack of equity, and I'll come back to this point, and you know the inequality that's so pervasive and that prevents any meaningful uh, human rights conform response because ultimately you know, we have seen how the differentiated impact has really placed the disadvantaged persons in, in more in a situation of enhanced vulnerability. So in my view, if, if there's a chance, I mean, it will all depend and we'll refer back to Gianluca on how the debates on equity uh, evolve, how broad will equity be understood. In my view, and this will be the, I have shared this critique previously with Mark as well. Um, you know, equity in my perspective should not only refer to the pharmaceutical remedies that are will be available because in a future pandemic they may take much longer to be developed. Equity, in my view, should kick in at the very beginning, even in the absence of effective pharmaceutical remedies that need to be shared and distributed equitably. Equity should really be a more a holistic perspective. I know this can be challenging to frame in a treaty. And it's a, a, a very comprehensive term, but in my view, this would be a meaningful way forward if we really want to take seriously this uh, dimension, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, my question is is for Jean Nguyen. You know, we've discussed this quite a lot of the So, I'm going to ask you something quite specific about. Um, WHO competency and capacity, I guess. And, and that is at the moment, all of this discussion is centered around WHO and, and the treaty. And you know, one thing we know as a field is that global, you know, you can have a discussion about whether global health law is even a thing in, in and of itself, or whether it's health implications from lots of different areas. So one of the things that worries me about the, the, the treaty is the sort of the focus on WHO, you know, how can you address countermeasures without engaging WTO? How can you address pathogen sharing without engaging CBD? How can you address One Health without FAO and OIE? So to what extent does WHO's constitutional mandate allow it to adequately address these issues by itself, would you say? So I'm going to interrupt uh, Stephen as let me know his question builds nicely on marks, and so maybe mm -hmm. we'll put both together and have a global response. Great, yeah, thanks so much, uh, Lisa. Thanks for the presentations. So just building on what Mark uh, just said, um, I think one of the questions in my mind is that in global health, well, or at least in our 
national institutions or in public health or issues specifically, there isn't a culture of making use of its full normative authorities. And so I think it's clear in reading the constitution of WHO when it was drafted, there was very much this intention that the organization would be stewarding ongoing political processes to craft norms of various kinds. And yet that hasn't happened. And as a result, there isn't a culture within the global health community around norm making in the way that there is, for example, in other sectors like the environmental sector, where uh, COP26 uh, that just happened, the moment uh, everyone's kind of there, or in human rights or in trade and elsewhere. And so building on that, I'm thinking of this suddenly we're in COVID-19, there's this call for not only reopening the IHR, which uh, I think actually at least everyone in the consortium uh, thinks is a good idea. We've got on paper, we've got on, we, we published a commentary about that, most of us. Um, personally, I'm supportive of the, of the pandemic treaty. I know that there's some disagreement on that. But how do you then, how do we think this is going to go in light of that lack of that culture within the global health community? Because one thing I worry about is I have heard in some circumstances that one of the advantages of a treaty, as opposed to we're just revising the national health regulations, is that a treaty would engage a different kind of person, actually take the negotiations, potentially move it away from public health as opposed to keeping public health at the center. So it builds very nice, I think, on what Martin was talking about competence, mindset about culture. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, excellent and, and big questions. Um, I think we shouldn't put too much on the shoulders of the IHR. The IHR had a fairly narrow focus document and the vast improvement of what we had before. But I think it's good to see, we should see them as a work in progress because the IHR clearly were meant to fight SARS. They look at the last war. And so, as, as uh, I think Pedro said, or, or Sherry said, uh, relatively individualized, limited measure to prevent the COVID. I mean, COVID, I chat was supposed to prevent COVID. And so, I think the challenge will be uh, whether in the IHR we have the instrument to first uh, scale it up uh, to address the, but the specificities of something like COVID with population size, restrictions, and so on, but also. And that would be to me even more challenging to leave a framework open to possible new wars that we can't imagine now. That, in a way, what the structure of the IHR was supposed to do something open ended that is not locked in in a list of diseases and so on, but still, still the, the, the fundamental philosophy was clearly responding to recent events. So, again, I wouldn't reify to use uh, the title of your keynote speech, the IHR. I would definitely see them as a work in progress, and I don't think many people have seen them that way. Uh, the second is, I think, a, a pandemic treaty. Uh, I think it can fix certain aspects of what Sharifa was talking about. Uh, again, I would mention um, one health and zoonotic risk, because clearly we are we're sitting ducks waiting for the next zoonotic disease. We clearly have a blind spot that needs some fixing, uh, and some other aspects that I mentioned. But uh, the, there is a need to look at the larger ecosystem. As, as Mark said, everybody is obsessing about WHO and the treaty. And maybe, uh, and I'm surprised at the weakness, for example, of the UN, uh, the, the, the General Assembly has passed wishy-washy resolution, security council has been paralyzed for months. Even now, the IPPR just came yesterday with the reiterating states, it said we need the, the General Assembly to step in, to really elevate it to a different level of policy. But I, I didn't see it. So, but there is a need to engage um, a larger ecosystem that deals with financing, so with the financial institutions, with the UN, um, with trying to rationalize some of these proposals about new bodies and so on. So the, there is a need for a larger, uh, landscape of action, which is very ambitious for even the best politicians. But in the end, uh, if we put all the eggs in one basket, we don't go too far. Mm -hmm. And in terms of uh, what you were saying, Mark and, 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 and Steve, uh, I'm also not terribly convinced that, the, that there will be the capacity uh, and the, for the moment, politically, nobody is screaming blue murder at having a WHO pandemic treaty deal with zoonotics, zoonotics, for example. But these are different communities, nationally and internationally. And I doubt that we will let WHO somehow take the, the lead and tell them what to do. It's easy to talk about 
collaboration and so on. But we know, at least as experience in my career, how compartmentalized at the best of times the things are both nationally and internationally. So I fear a bit that either it will be reduced to the minimum common denominator or that there will be serious political battles in how much that we should be. <coughs> Leaving alone the question of capacity, because I look at the SETC uh, and, for example, the famous protocol on illicit trade, WHO is very limited resources. This thing is pattering along because maybe WHO wasn't the best in institutional house to really support and lead the development of something that deals with criminal law and so on and so forth. The, the norm making culture obviously is a long story. Uh, I think it's been missing since the beginning because of historical development. Um, it was not what the draft of the constitution assumed. Public health and global health went in different directions. Improvement of, uh, of healthcare, of medicine, of science, most developing countries were not interested in new treatments, were interested in improving uh, the situation. So I think it's an accumulation of history that generated a bit this, uh, this vicious circle of uh, suspicion with international law, lack of familiarity, but also the fact that when health became deeply political in the 90s with HIV aid with the security problem with WTO and the explosion of neoliberalism, a lot of law was already written. Uh, and so, in a way, that show the, 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 to me, the, the niche that could still be filled by uh, health law shrank considerably. And WHO found itself either contributing to other processes or to, again, falling back on soft law, which is the, at least the area of, cons of consensus among public health. So this is interesting dynamic, uh, more to perpetuating themselves. And I'm not so sure that this pandemic treaty will somehow break completely this moment. And it will be the, the, the entry point to 20, if we need them, of course, the health treaties in the future. But certainly will uh, improve the health literacy of the, of, the, of the global health community, which including the secretariat, which is missing, frankly. So I think the jury is out at this point. Sorry, I spoke very long, and then sorry. Uh, so I'm, I'm not seeing any uh, chat or discussion from online, and I really encourage uh, our online attendees to post their questions and comments. We have some really fantastic people out there who I know are real experts in this field. But I will turn to some questions in the room, uh, first Stephanie and then Sam. Um, thank you, Lisa. Um, I think um, my questions around um, the capacities of WHO uh, have been answered already. Just wanted to make a point, and, and that might um, reassure you some, uh, as you said, well, what went wrong? Why, why did we miss um, the, the public health subject as um, um, human rights community? And, and um, maybe you have picked up a few information telling you that, well, isn't it? Uh, you know, the, 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 the experts discussing the IHR until 2005 they didn't have um, they didn't have human rights in mind, and I would say um, it, it's it's um, a real problem because um, the discussion around health and human rights started actually with the AIDS pandemic. So we have very good work and and rounding work uh, establishing the links between health and human rights. In starting in the 80s, but actually uh, the pandemic has revealed um, to the rest of the world uh, how important it is. And I wanted to make a second point. Um, you, you said uh, you, you talked about the reasons why you were extremely worried today, and I completely agree with your analysis. And would add um, another point, which is from the lack of education of the world population on women rights. We don't see people um, going in the street for more equity, more equality, more, more access to vaccines. We see people going in the street because they're not happy to have to wear masks. And uh, that's, that's also an issue. Thank you. Sam. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you my, my question for, for Pedro and Gianluca is uh, kind of as a technical legal way forward. Um, uh, Pedro referred to the, you know, the, the IHR referred to human rights as obituary dictum, and I, I, I that is the correct approach, but at least it did refer to it. And so, you know, Gianluca, kind of in your experience, 
keeping in mind the competencies and the lack of certain resources in the WHO. Is, is it possible to address some of this, whether it's in the IHR or the pandemic to ERC, by just including a provision that says whatever measures are taken in response must be mindful and follow international human rights obligations. That way, you don't have to kind of come up with the, with the competence. It, it's you know, but but that that non obiter dictum, that key reference, would allow the right people at the national international level to then engage with this with this process. Thank you. Well, uh, just to follow up on Stephanie's point and actually linking it to Jaguka's previous uh, comment on the role of the WHO and its own views on how global health should be steered. And I mean, this emphasis on the biomedical dimension is, I think, also spills over to uh, the role that lawmaking can play because, I mean, to, in, the recent, in the last decade, and uh, this is up until the 2010s, there was still the discourse that anything that was not related to the best clinical interventions and the better way to deal with diseases was seen as political. And of course, if it's political, that we don't touch it because you know, it's, uh, you know, we get into trouble. And this would include human rights uh, up until recently. And to me, it is quite telling, for instance, and uh, speaking, uh, referring back to Stephanie's one of a lack of education and which reflects on this strict division between biomedical and everything else, uh, this lack of education in human rights. Well, one example that highlights this is how up until Te uh, Director General Tedros, all WHO Director Generals were medical doctors, even though this is not a legal requirement under the constitution or any other of the instruments, but it does reflect what type of emphasis they were looking at. And this indeed, um, in my view, informed how the WHO deploy its lawmaking normative authority because they said, well, this is, these are all political matters, so why would, should we get involved with them? At least that's my own perspective, if you are oversimplifying. And well, on the technical legal way forward mentioned by Sam, indeed, at least it, the DHR does reflect human rights. Maybe it would be uh, an advantage to leave it open as it, it, it you know, as ultimately states are the ones that will interpret the international health regulations. So they could still you know, push it forward and say, well, we want to interpret this even in an even stronger manner than we currently do. But we go back to the points that Gianluca was referring to. So is there a political will by member states themselves, not just by the WHO, but member states ultimately will be the ones that shift one way or the other in terms of the path that the IHR particularly not to mention the treaty will take. Thank you. Yeah, in, so I guess the, 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 there is a technical fix, but there is a bigger political issue of international <laughs> politics, basically. Yeah. So the IHR is fair to say they are not so bad uh, because the, the principle in Article 3 that you mentioned talks about dignity, human rights, and fundamental freedom. That's boilerplate human rights language, it's not unicorns. So I think it was, uh, at least it was a principle that should guide the interpretation of an instrument. That's, I think, a mainstream uh, drafting techniques to make sure that the, the, the states are reminded that they need to interpret the IHR alongside that obligation. Then they, there is an article, the article dealing with persons. Obviously, there is a focus on travelers, on international spread. It doesn't really focus on what happens inside the state as such, as to be its law. And so the, the personal scope of application is limited. But even in the limited scope, there are some articles that are very mindful of human rights. So the fact that you can apply restrictive measure only based on the risk assessment or the certain process and so on. So there was a, a, a human rights awareness there. You have Article 45 of treatment of personal data that came from the European, that very much was with the GDPR in mind. Um, and there is Article 57 on the general rule of interpretation that basically said IHR without prejudice to other agreements. So there is an open door there to a uh, sort of all, all in all friendly, human rights friendly interpretation. The point is then probably who applies them at the national level, they fall back on uh, 
public health agency that are now the most human rights literate. Uh, and the politics of the moment, the politics of crisis, where, as you correctly, very cogently said, human rights sometimes take a, take a backseat. So we can definitely improve the language in here or in a, in, a, in a future pandemic treaty. But then the question becomes, and that it goes back to, to what your people are doing, of advocating at, at the policy level to make human rights part of the implementation and not seen as something you think after the, the, the fact or that you brush aside at the time of crisis. So we have a question from uh, our online participants from Axel Abode, and I'll pose it to both of you. Maybe you can make very brief remarks, and then we'll close the session and have a far shorter break than we planned. Um, so Axel asks, um, how is the pandemic treaty planning to avoid the downfalls of the PIP agreement, which Mark will be speaking about in the next session? And secondly, how are national experiences been taken into account when framing the pandemic treaty? So I'll open to both of you, maybe. Can, can, can you repeat it? So the question is, how is the pandemic treaty planning to avoid the downfalls of the PIP agreement? And how are national experiences being taken into account? And this is a question from Axel Abode. So I'll open to you to make brief more. Mm -hmm. so, I'll refrain from speaking much about the PIP agreement because Mark is really the expert that will lead us later through it. So I'll pass the hot potato to Mark on that. Regardless, though, I will only add you know, there's a challenge that the PIP um, framework is uh, as a technically legally non binding. That's not all of the story, right? But uh, this might then refer. To an even more challenges anymore if you want to set it in binding law then it will, it will be subjected to a higher political back and forth uh, and the second question how a national experience is being taken into account well uh well that's um i i have well from what habit i had seen in the in the for instance in the report on the zero draft of the new treaty they try to keep it very general in order not to pinpoint very specific responses, because this might, of course, lead to the impression that ah, we're taking one national response as the gold standard, but who, why should that be the gold standard for the rest of us? So I guess if in political terms, it can be quite tricky to zero in on national experiences and point them out as either post positively or negatively. And this would be risky in my view in such a process. Yeah. Very quickly, I'm not sure why the question that says that the downfall of the PIP framework, I don't see a downfall actually. I think with all these shortcomings, the PIP framework is, uh, is, is, is an interesting experiment and was precisely meant as a counterbalance to the very transactional bilateral approach of the biodiversity law. So and, and actually, as, as people are starting thinking, if the pathogen sharing finds a place in a pandemic treaty to use by and large the blueprint of PIP, uh, multilateralizing actually uh, the access and benefit uh, sort of balance uh, in, in a treaty. I don't know what Mark thinks about it, talk about it in a moment, but actually I see it potentially as a positive model. So with that, uh, I thank you. I was very struck, Gianluca, by your suggestion that health became political in the 90s of HIV. I think Rudolf Virchow might have something to say about that. Mm -hmm. But I think it also kind of is food for thought, uh, you know, in the same way that we're thinking about the slipperiness or, and the, the, the lack, the, the softness of the categories and the binary between hard and soft. I think we can think similarly about the, 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 cat, the binary between political and the technical. So to our online audience, uh, we're going to take a five minute break. Uh, please do come back um, and uh, we'll go on to our second panel. Thank you. Thank you for our wonderful uh, panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.